Welcome to episode 306 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm okay, Rob. How are you doing? Doing all right. Uh, any news from you? Anything you want to share? Mm, well, I guess I could share that it looks like training is starting to return. Everything so, seems to be going back to normal. Yeah, that's the thing. Hopefully, this uh, Delta variant nonsense won't um, shut things back down again. But yeah. from everything that I've read and seen, it seems for people who are vaccinated, it's no more risky than any of the other variants. It's just traveling very quickly through the people who aren't vaccinated right now. Right. And so if you uh, aren't vaccinated, consider getting vaccinated. If you're, if you're not vaccinated, definitely go get one. I, I've been doing fine with it. I haven't gotten any secret messages from Bill Gates or, or anything like that. It's safe. There have been zero <laughs> zombie outbreaks so far. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, at the top of every episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we got a tweet from uh, Pratikanand saying, late to the party, but really enjoyed the conversation on CPP cast on Rigel Engine. I've contributed to the project too, so even more happy for it to see some more recognition. It's an important step in video game preservation IMO. And yeah, that was, that was the, a uh, fun convo. Duke Nukem engine, right? Yeah, yeah. We've but we've done a couple episodes on kind of that topic lately, uh, preserving old video games. Yeah, I may That's or may not have actually sought out people who would be <laughs> good interviews for that. Yeah, well, it's been fun. Okay, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cppcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Andre Sertik. Andre is a scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory, originally from the Czech Republic. His background is computational physics and high-performance computing. In addition, he has been actively involved in open source. He is the original author of SimPy, SimEngine, L4Tran, and a co-founder of the Fortran Lang organization. His current mission is to rejuvenate Fortran, a language for high-performance numerical computing. He likes and uses C++ as a great tool that allows him to deliver robust, very fast libraries and applications, including SimEngine and the L4Tran compiler. Andre, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I, I'm, I'm curious as we get into this interview, because I know the National Labs sponsor a lot of open source work. Um, is, is the work that you work on at the National Lab also open source? Is it related to these projects too? Uh, some some parts. Uh, I'm funded a little bit on the L4Tran compiler. In fact, I'm funded on L4, oh, sorry, on Fortran to C++ translation because, as you probably know, a lot of people are moving away from Fortran to C++, and so I'm happy to help with that also. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that later. Awesome. Okay, thanks. Sounds good. Okay, so, uh, Andre, we just have a couple news articles to discuss. Feel free to comment on these, and we'll start talking more about uh, Fortran and, and maybe SimPy and all that, okay? Awesome. Okay, uh, first one we have is the June 2021 ISO mailing. Uh, lots of pa new papers, as always. Um, I didn't have a chance to go over any of these in too much detail. Jason, I did see there was one for Constexper for CMath and CSTUDLib. So it looks like the Constexperizing of the standard library is continuing, so that's always good. That one has been a long time coming. Uh, because they have problems with yeah they're yeah they're still it's revision eight of that paper hmm. yeah uh, anything you either of you wanted to call out with uh, these papers yeah I like I like the stick trace uh, from exception paper it's the P two three seven zero R zero the idea I think if I understand it correctly that the, the language itself should somehow help you get the stack trace when you get an exception that could which, be handy. I, yeah, very nice I, for debugging. I do that by hand in every C++ project that I have to get nice exception, so I like that. <laughs> yeah, very nice. And it looks like there's movement on executors of some sort, standard execution, um, and first revision of this paper. Oh, I didn't see that one. For managing asynchronous execution on a generic execution context. So it looks like there might be, maybe we'll get that into C++23. That would certainly be nice. And uh, I know a lot of other things are waiting for that to come in, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, next thing we have is a GitHub repository, uh, which is really just a collection of the uh, 
this graph and I guess um, maybe some code that they use to run it. Uh, C++ library include times. Uh, so it's a nice graph of all the, a lot of the standard library headers and also some popular, uh, you know, open source library headers and, and how long it takes to include them uh, if you are using these headers. And uh, yeah, um, I, I guess maybe some of these were maybe a little bit surprising, like file system takes a huge amount of time to include. Maybe that's not surprising. I don't know. Right now, the only one that's surprising to me is that regex isn't the one that's at the end of the <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Regex is actually very small. They have a, the kernel library. It takes 1.1 second. Uh, and I tested it on my Mac, and it takes 6 milliseconds with Klein on my Mac. So I'm a little bit surprised it takes 1.1 second on Windows. Yeah, this is all done using Visual Studio, uh, I believe. Yeah. So it would be nice to see... If if someone did that this with GCC and Clang, so you could compare, you know, these different popular libraries on on the different platforms. Right. Yeah. Another one that stands out here. This is I find a little disappointing is Speedlog, which I do like using, and it's That's... actually the highest one on this entire chart. Yeah, and I was a little surprised that that was the highest one and not like Windows H or, or something like that that you would kind of think would be uh, one of the worst offenders. Yeah. yeah. And most of these things, you know, like if you really care, you can isolate their usage, but something like speed log, you really can't. I mean, yeah, when realistically, if you want to use a lot <laughs> the same logger in all of your CDP files, yeah. hmm. I have to give that a look. Okay. And then we also have uh, this is not necessarily directly C++ related, but uh, I see a lot of programmers on Twitter talking about this over the past week. Uh, GitHub Copilot got announced, and this is uh, an AI you know, programming assistant. It's available as a Visual Studio Code extension, and it's you know, powered by all the repositories on GitHub. Looks pretty fancy. I'm not sure if it's directly related to the Visual Studio uh, AI tool that I know has been Visual Studio for at least the last, you know, release or two. Yeah. Last, last year or two. I've like turned on the Visual Studio one and then not necessarily noticed a difference in the autocomplete. So I don't know if I was just using it wrong or if it didn't. didn't this one looks a little something. different in that like you can write your function name and it suggests like an entire, you know, block of code for you, which is maybe a little scary. Well, the question is, once this gets good enough, can I start training AIs instead of <laughs> humans? Yeah, maybe. What do you think about this one, Andre? Yeah, I just think it's very interesting. Uh, I wonder how they do it, if they have an abstract syntax tree for every language, or and how much semantics they encode, or if this is all machine learning. It would be interesting to know the details. Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing we have, uh, Jason, this is the announcement for the uh, CPPCon field trip for this year? Yes, the field trip. I'm now, gonna... you organized it two years ago. Did you have any hand in this one? Um, I did not have a, no, no not directly. Um, a t when it was being planned for the 2020 conference, the it's this, it was the same plan that we wanted to do for the we I say we loosely the the meetup wanted to do for 2020 mm -hmm. and the organizer brought up this idea and we all collectively agreed that this is kind of like a this is Colorado right like this is going to give you a taste of Colorado because uh, the field trip will be starting at the Gaylord and then going up into the the mountains. Um, uh, I don't know what we are like nine, ten thousand feet, something like that, uh, from the five thousand feet that we are at down here. So from like uh, sixteen hundred meters to like twenty, thirty-three thousand meters ish, around in that ballpark, mm -hmm. um, and doing a narrow gauge railway that will uh, take you to one of the old mining camps, and then um, and you can go in. And I've done this trip before myself. It's been a long time. But you can actually like see what a working mine used to be like. I'm that's pretty cool. sure that they're planning to actually go into the mine. And then uh, when that's done, then stop in Idaho Springs for Bojo's Pizza. And I know some of 
our friends who like to drive up to C++ now make a point of actually stopping in Idaho Springs just for Bojo's Pizza on the way from the Denver airport to Aspen. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a Colorado institution. And if you care about beer, I don't know how much time that you'll have, but there's two breweries within walking distance of Bojo's where you could grab and go and take back to the hotel with you. Nice, nice. All right. Well, uh, Andre, uh, we've talked about Fortran on, on the show, you know, plenty of times on, on CVV cast, but usually we're talking about it as if, you know, it's very much a thing of the past, a somewhat dead language. Um, but you're actively working on it. You want That's to correct. Start us off there. Sure. Well, it is an old language. One of the, if not the oldest high level language, uh, started at IBM, I believe, uh, in early 1950s. Uh, and you're right that uh, a lot of people think that it's, it, it is uh, dying or, or even dead. But, um, and I also, I most, you know, m most of you who studied any kind of physics or any kind of kind of engineering degree, you, you probably know that uh, your advisor typically has some kind of old Fortran code around and you're you stuck with it, you have to, uh, you have to resurrect it and fix some bugs in it. And so that's mo most people's experience with Fortran. Uh, and then, of course, I, I knew Python and I was mostly using Python and C++. Uh, but then I came back to Fortran in um, around 2010. I was at Lawrence Livermore National Lab as an intern. And I was optimized. I had some Python code with some Fortran kernels uh, for some electronic structure. And we were optimizing it. and. Eventually, we rewrote it in, in, in Fortran, and that's when I kind of learned Fortran, the modern incarnation of Fortran. And I realized that it's it's a really nice language. Uh, it uh, it feels like Python and NumPy, and so for numerical computational uh, things, it it it's very handy. Everything is in the language, and then the compilers uh, can optimize it beautifully. And so that hooked me in, um, and then. As time goes, 2015, 16, um, the, usually what I see the direction of, um, let's say I, I already was working at Los Alamos National Lab. We have a lot of Fortran codes, a lot of production Fortran uh, codes, but I only see one direction. Typically, uh, people want to move away from Fortran to mostly to C++. So yes, uh, and, a lot of, and if you talk to a lot of people, um, it's very common. Um, that's kind of the sentiment that Fortran is a dying language. Um, and so that's how I joined. I decided to uh, fix that and <laughs> make sure it's not a dying language anymore. And so, um, and also I should say the term dying, every time I say it, I get a pushback from the Fortran community. I always, they always say it's not dying. It's never been that, you know, you should not be using such words, but you know, it's one way to <laughs> characterize it. Uh, so I now I prefer to use the term rejuvenate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, but yes, uh, it's uh, definitely uh, in the 2015, 16, 17 timeframe, it was not doing well at all. And that's when I decided to join. So I just, I wanted to help fix it, fix, because I, I like the language. Um, and we can, we can get back to it uh, later why, but I wanted to fix it. And so I thought, well, how, how, what can I do even? So I figured, well, there was only one organized community around Fortran, and there was the Fortran Standards Committee. So I looked it up online, and there's not much information there. I didn't know anybody there, but there was a mailing list, so I decided to join it. And then I asked them, you know, is there a meeting? And there was a meeting in Vegas, I believe. Uh, so I, you know, booked my flight and <laughs> came to the meeting, and I I just didn't know what to expect. Uh, you know, do they, you know, are they meeting, you know, or how has that even, you know, how many people are there and so on. Uh, turns out there were about 20 people, 15, 20 people, and, and they were indeed working on uh, new features to Fortran. And so I asked them, like, what's your vision? Um, like, I feel the situation of Fortran as a language is not very good. Um, do, you, do you have any plans to, to fix it? Um, you know, I see, I see a lot of codes around me moving away from Fortran, and I don't see any code moving to Fortran. You know, do you have any kind of um, ideas how to fix that? And the feeling I got was that they did not. <laughs> yeah, I asked, well, 
the, the, one of the argument that I heard there was that um, at universities uh, that you don't have Fortran classes anymore, and so that that they teach, let's say, C plus plus, or I would even argue Python. Um, let's say, um, well, so I told them, well, I have some ideas, and so. Uh, it was, I had a very early prototype of L4chan, which is a, a compiler I've been working on. It, the prototype, by the way, was still in Python, because I, I like Python. So it was in Python, it was just a prototype showing that it can work interactively. And so this L4chan compiler, um, I'll talk more about it later, but I showed them the prototype in a Jupyter notebook, interactively executing Fortran cells. And uh, I think I think they, they, they liked it. And I, kind of was trying to motivate them that I think this is how we can attract a lot of new users from the Python and MATLAB Julia community. Um, and I still think that. And so that was set up 2000, I think now we are 2018 or 19. Uh, since then, I've written L4 trying to uh, C++ and we can talk more about the details later. Um, and, and also, um, so the Fortran, you know, as I mentioned, the Fortran Standards Committee was, it felt kind of secluded. So unless you were already on it, not many people knew much about it. So the other thing I've done is um, I created this GitHub repository for people to submit proposals to the committee. And didn't think of it much. I thought, well, let's at least try, see, see what happens. Um, and it was tremendously successful. I announced it on Twitter and we immediately got dozens and dozens of people just coming in and opening issues and saying, you know, I would like to fix that and that. And uh, one of the more popular, um, uh, I would say, proposal is to release Fortran standard every three years instead of five years. And <laughs> another proposal is to put the standard itself on GitHub and use GitHub as opposed to these old um, papers with like hand diff essentially to propose changes to it and so on. Um, anyway, uh, it was very successful. And then from that uh, initial I would say, online community, we started an effort that we now called Fortran Lang. We first started with uh, with writing a standard library for Fortran. So Fortran itself as a language has a lot of um, features uh, as well as intrinsic functions like sine, cosine, Bessel functions and so on. But but there's a lot of things that almost every Fortran programmer would like to have, uh, and they are not part of the language. And so, so we decided, well, why don't we write a standard library, so, sort of in the scope of uh, MATLAB or SciPy. So all the special functions, all math functions, as well as all kinds of um, algorithms like sorting, one example. Fortran doesn't have sorting in the language. Um, uh, and so, we did that, and then one led, one thing led to another. So we then created um, uh, a, a website and a logo for Fortran. Uh, if you if you <laughs> Google Fortran or or you know in Bing or DuckDuckGo, the first or second page is the FortranLang.org website. So that's the Fortran website. So we created the website for Fortran, and then um, and then I guess the most exciting project there besides our Fortran is. Fortran package manager called FPM. We can talk more about that. Oh, wow. Um, so that's how it all started. Oh, uh, we also have a discourse uh, uh, forum. Discourse, for those who don't know, it's an it's a online forum. It's sort of like a mailing list, but allows you to edit your post. And it's it's a very nice way to communicate uh, and to communicate with the wide community uh, online. And so we have hundreds of users. Uh, so I'm very excited about all, all these developments. Uh, especially that within one year, we, we launched the website uh, about a year ago. Within one year, we got in Google even uh, to the second page after Wikipedia for Fortran. So that's um, so so things are changing. Oh, and the other thing that happened within last year was um, there is this Tiobe index of the kind of rank languages. I'm not quite sure exactly how they do it, but uh, somehow out of nowhere, Fortran ja jumped from, I don't even know, 50th place to the first page uh, eventually it made it you know um, again uh, I think it must be the web page I assume but you know I'll, I'll take any any good news and so it's this is um, all very positive and that, that all happened within the last year pretty much year and so a half if we can get a little bit of like timing perspective here because you were talking about modern Fortran and I might get I'm I think there's a good chance I'm gonna get this wrong but I'm pretty sure my okay. dad learned Fortran 60 when he was in university yeah. Um, 
so like what what is what is the modern version of Fortran? You said it is being it has been updated. What when was it last standard last released? Yeah, well I'll start I'll start in the back. So it's, that is Fortran four. I don't know if that was the very first standard that they standardized because they had multiple compilers and so on. After that it was Fortran sixty six, then Fortran seventy six. Okay. Then it's Fortran seventy seven. After that, the next big revision was Fortran ninety. Uh, then 95, uh, 2003, 2008, and, 2008, wow. and 2018. Okay. And, okay. and in terms of uh, kind of modern, what most people consider modern, so F77 or Fortran 77, uh, back then they used punch cards. And so punch card, you know, I had to, you know, I was born in 1983, so I've never used punch cards. I had to look it up on YouTube exactly how that works. But I know some other folks might be thinking, oh, how, how, how is it that you don't know how it works? But it's just a card, and then it has the first, I believe, six columns are used as control characters. And so when they converted those programs on punch cards into files, uh, you end up with a format that's called fixed form. So the first six columns, I believe, or seven, are control characters. And so you cannot use them to write code. You have to you have to put spaces there, or you can you can use them to, as comments or labels. And so um, that's called fixed form. It's very hard to program in because you have to you know put six spaces all the time, and it just it's very particular. Uh, that was Fortran seventy seven. Fortran ninety introduced a, a, what's called free form, which looks like like Python. Essentially, you, you just write your code like you know, like any modern language. So that's Fortran 90. And the other thing that happened, Fortran 90 introduced uh, modules um, oh, okay. uh, with dependencies, all that stuff, um, derived types. Uh, de uh, so that is it's like a C struct. Um, and uh, it also introduced some improvements to the arrays. You can allocate them at runtime. time. Fortran 77, I believe you have to allocate the array in the main program. Uh, you can, however, pass it to subroutines as unknown length. That all works. So it, it's really cool when you think about it. It's Fortran 77. It's very old, and 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 you write a subroutine just like you would today. So you accept the length of all the arrays you have, and you have multi-dimensional arrays, and, and this all works nicely. But Fortran 90 adds, you can actually allocate it at runtime at any time you want. So that's Fortran 90. And then since then, uh, most of the additions are relatively small. So for Fortran um, uh, 2008 adds objects and methods, stuff like that. Um, and then the rest of the changes are just kind of fixes here and there. Things like F77 uses, I believe, slash and a parenthesis as, as um, you know, when you want to write an array as an array delimiter. So Fortran 2003 or 8, I can't remember, introduces square brackets, you know, to make it like Python, oh, okay. stuff like that. They also added. Um, like parallel loop, it's called do concurrent. Uh, I believe that's 2008 or so. Uh, they also added um, parallel arrays, they are called co arrays, into the language itself. Um, before that, well, it's not used too much. We can get to the later why, but the idea is to put parallel features into the language itself and let the compilers handle that. So the co arrays are sort of, sort of, sort of like MPI, like one sided MPI, if people are familiar with that. Yeah, I was going to say MPI is one of the parallel things that's supported on Fortran, right? That's, yes, yes, it is. Okay. In fact, most codes, all the codes, I would say, use MPI for historical reasons. But coarrays add that feature directly into the language, and, and the syntax is beautiful. It's just um, you just have arrays, and you just have in, in brackets, you just put um, you know which which MPI or which coarray image rank you want to you know access, and the compiler handles it knows when the data is uh, available and when it's needed so it will it will start sending the data you know as soon as it has it interesting and so it's like one-sided mpi but but you don't have to worry about it so it's very nice the idea is very nice hmm. in That's practice yeah to, to make uh, in practice for uh, the reason people don't use it too much is because um well they already have the code using mpi so it's a you know you don't want to rewrite it and for new codes you want the, the, the compiler support wasn't great until the, just very recently. So, so then L Fortran, your compiler, which we'll I guess get to more in a minute, it supports Fortran 2018. So, it, so the parser supports full Fortran 2018. 
if you you know I encourage people to try it and report any bug uh, that, that you that you find in the parser itself. You can use L4Tran space FMT like format. It will format your code. It will for now it will skip comments and empty lines. We are uh, that we are still working on, but everything else, every single thing should work. So it so it parses to AST, abstract syntax tree, and back to source code. Uh, the se semantics um, we are now uh, working on. So we the current status is we are trying to we kind of identified a, a proxy app. It's called Snap. It's a particle transport code from Los Alamos actually, but not written by me. I know the people who wrote it, but I have nothing to do with that. And it's Fortran 95, uh, and we are about half the way to, to be able to compile it. We'll have the modules compile, uh, but but we are still fixing things to actually compile that. And the time frame, uh, we are really close. I'm hoping within months, um, you know, at the end of summer, I'm really hoping we are able to compile it. And at that point, we'll release uh, MVP, minimal viable product. And we'll ask people to test it out and start using it. So that will be roughly Fortran 95 uh, level. So the parser is full 2018, but the, the actual compilation, you know, semantics and LLVM code, you know, all that stuff uh, will be roughly Fortran 95, which turns out to be really actually large. The, most of the hard work is, is in there. You know, the, after we after this works, uh, what, what will remain is just the objects and just kind of a runtime library, all these functions, all kinds of corner cases and so on. But the hardest part will be behind us. Okay. But before we talk more about like L4 trans and these other projects, um, you know, maybe we should just back up for a moment and uh, go over, you know, how Fortran compares to other languages like C++ and, and why do you feel like it, it, you know, deserves all this attention and, and, you know, why are you against, you know, people converting old Fortran code into C++, which you said you're, uh, you know, trying to get them to stop doing. <laughs> or, or you're encouraged. Uh, Fortran has a C++ backend, so it translates oh, okay. uh, the Fortran into C++. So oh, it translates it into C++. Okay. Uh -huh. oh, okay. So, so if people want to move away and and just develop in C++, they could they will be able to use L Fortran to do that. Um, oh wow. So, so this also cool. But um, in fact, I think I'm hoping a lot of people will decide. Well, if I'm not locked into Fortran, I can and if I can always translate to C++, maybe I will stay in Fortran. But Anyway, so why why Fortran? So the main I would say three motivations for Fortran is to um, essentially enable scientists and and physicists and domain experts, engineers, to to write domain specific code, mm -hmm. and essentially write numerical code, um, and be able to maintain it themselves. So mm -hmm. and I would say there are three kind of pillars. Uh, one is the basics mathematics is in the language itself. So Fortran has exponentiation, has complex numbers, has uh, all kinds of special functions. You know, F77 already had all that. Um, it uh, it is more restrictive thing, I would say, and higher level than C++. So it's so for example, it has the multidimensional arrays, but in the language, it has pointers, but you cannot just point to anything. You have to declare what you point to as target. So things like that. So it's, it's much more restricting. F seventy seven. If you you know if anybody plays with that, it's very restricting. It's it feels oh it's just so hard to do anything. It's just you you have to be you know it's very restricting. But the advantage of that is that it's very simple. There's not much to it. F seventy seven is just a bunch of subroutines and functions and arrays and and loops. Um, and it's and and also that kind of design allows the compilers historically to optimize it really well, uh, so which means you get very good speed. So those are the three kind of advantages. Um, the, uh, in like I would say the kind of if I can expand on that historically the, the mission uh, for Fortran from the very beginning was to allow scientists, engineers, and domain experts to write programs that naturally express the mathematics and algorithms employed, are portable across HPC, so high-performance computing systems, uh, remain viable over decades of use, and extract a high percentage of performance from the underlying hardware. So by so, the, so Fortran as a language, it, it feels high level. It doesn't have um, things like you cannot inline assembly, for example. The language does not allow you to do that. You cannot, um, the, the language itself doesn't, uh, have a memory memory kind of uh, model. In other words, you you know in C and C plus plus you can 
and you know you can go into the bits you know and how in floating point you can kind of rely on how floating point is represented and stuff like that in fortran uh, you kind of operate on floating point more in a more abstract uh, manner and the reason is historical for fortran ran on all kinds of machines that did not have ieee you know floating point that all kinds of weird if you look up on you know all, all the all the high performance computing systems in the past they have all kinds of architectures and yet the fortran compilers were able to take the program and just compile it to run on the machine okay so that's the motivation and so then with with that in mind do you support or recommend or what it would the process be like if your engineers scientist wanted to just keep code in fortran that's part of a larger c application and it sounds like you can just emit the c and potentially just link it together eventually so i eventually. think there are, there are multiple uh, approaches the basic approach so i would say languages in modern era they have to interoperate so mm -hmm. you need to be able to have a fortran library and just call it in c from c or from python just mm -hmm. just seamlessly uh to support that uh fortran uh, we have some prototypes kind of showing that it works uh just it should provide the wrappers automatically for you it's a compiler it knows all the types knows everything right. it should just allow you to use it from c and python or julia matlab whatever you name it it should just work so so for example from python there should be a library where you can just use like import a module that that happens to be a photo module and the compiler behind the scenes should just wrap it and, and make it available for you or you can use it to generate uh, the wrappers as files so the traditionally the, the way you wrap Fortran from other languages is you uh, have to write, it's called ISO C binding. It's a special module in Fortran which allows you to interface C, either calling it or exposed to C. And then from C++ you have to, or Python, you have to then call this as a C library. But then typically Fortran has arrays. So in Python, for example, you don't want just a memory. You want a NumPy array that should be mapped to the same memory as in Fortran. So there's quite a bit of technical things involved. And so there are tools that allow you to do that. F2Py is for Python. For C++, um, I don't know actually if there is a tool that, well, one issue with C++, there are a lot of C++ libraries that can handle arrays. And so for each, you know, you have to have some kind of, uh, uh, you know, wrapping code. All of this should be, in my opinion, handled or at least helped by the compiler so that as a user, you can just go to C++ and just start using it. So that's one one answer. Um, the, the If you want to go away from Fortran, I also think the, the compiler should allow you to just translate all your Fortran code to C++. Um, technically, so, so it seems to be working. All we have to do just, what we are doing now is just kind of finish all the semantics and actually make it work for Fortran 95. But technologically, it seems to be working. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the code that's generated, code generated by tools is not necessarily often maintainable. <laughs> what so, is the code like generated from your tool? <laughs> yeah. So for um, uh, Lano, so Los Lanos National Lab, uh, most people like the Cocos C++ library for arrays. So we right now we just target Cocos, but it's not tied to we can we can change that also but later uh so so array expressions are transformed into cocos um array expressions and, and loops are simply transformed to to access um uh, uh cocos as, as the array implementation in c plus plus it looks uh we try to make it as readable as we can uh but i think it can be done so that it's readable uh, I have so F77. There is a tool called F2C, and mm -hmm. it translates yes. F77 to C. That's an old not, tool. It's an old tool and not that readable. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it can be done much better. Uh, the, the the subset that we can translate so far is very uh, readable. It, it's essentially when you think about it, it's a, so the compiler knows exactly what you are doing in Fortran because it knows how to translate it to LLVM, for example, or, or machine code. So it knows exactly the, the semantics. It knows that you have an array, it knows that you have a loop or, or a subroutine or a function. It knows exactly the type. So to make it readable in C++, all that's needed is to decide how you want to represent things in C++. And the huge advantage of C++ in this case is that because it's such a 
you know, bigger language, there's multiple ways you can represent think, the Fortran things. And, and the Fortran semantics is very simple. Even the latest incarnation of Fortran, it's still very simple. The types map nicely to C++ types. And then some of the corner cases can be handled uh, by the compiler and, and the arrays, for example. So the Cocos uh, arrays, they pretty much have all the operations and more than, than what the Fortran arrays allow you to do. The only thing they don't have, the main thing they don't have is in Fortran you can have array operations, so you can stack, op, op, you can operate on arrays as a whole. So those have to be written to uh, for loops. But the, the, again, the compiler has to do that anyway to emit uh, machine code. So so compiler has all the all the technology to do that, and uh, it's just about the, so the C plus plus backend. We are trying to, to to write it in a way so that it's readable, so that people actually you know like what they what they get. Right. So, aside from the ability of uh, L Fortran to generate C++ code from your Fortran code, what else sets it apart from? Are there other Fortran compilers, or is there just one other one? Uh, but, but what's a, else sets this one apart? So, so well, so there is about twelve Fortran compilers, oh, wow. but, okay. but not all. If you go to FortranLang.org, there is a section compilers, and we list all of them and links to them. So in terms of open source compilers, there is G4Tran, part of GCC. There is Flang, part of LLVM, and there is L4Tran. Those are the three main ones. There are there were a few more in the past, but they are not actively developed anymore. Does that mean Intel's is no longer maintained? So those are open source. And then you have commercial. So there's oh, Intel. Oh, sorry. Okay. So there is Intel as the main, I would say, historically at least, that's the main um, kind of compiler in terms of delivering optimized code. There is NAG compiler, there's Cray compiler, AMD, IBM, you know, all these companies have uh, typically their own uh, compiler. So, but I would say Intel and NAG are the two main ones that uh, we use often, at least. Um, so then what, how is L4 Tran different? Uh, it's interactive. So you can, you can use it to compile to binaries as any other compiler, but you can also use it interactively. So it feels like Python or Julia. So you can launch a, a REPL from a command line and it, it looks just like Python. You just do integer i and i equals five and, and you can start putting Fortran commands and, and each command gets um, uh, compiled to LLVM and loaded it, uh, and machine code loaded into memory and executed. Uh, the way it works technically is just like Julia works. In fact, Julia was a, a huge inspiration uh, for me to start L4 Fortran. I, I kind of, Investigated how they how they do this and, and realized oh I think this can be done in uh, for Fortran also, um, and so that's one big change, big difference. And the other difference is that it has multiple backends. And I would say the design of Fortran is it's something a little bit uh, unique. Uh, I'll just quickly kind of describe it. So there is a parser. Parser parses to abstract syntax tree AST, and then the AST gets transformed. So that, then all the semantics gets checked. And then it gets transformed to a representation that we called abstract semantic representation asr wow. it's a, again it's, it's a standalone representation that represents just the semantics so it has a symbol table and things like that um and and you can print it to a screen you can give it kind of back to the user so they can see exactly what the compiler sees is exposed anyway and and then all the backend just take this asr and do something so llvm you know backend generates llvm code We'll, uh, C++ backend generates C++ code. The Python wrapper backends that we are, will write will generate Python wrappers or whatever. And then we also have x86 uh, direct machine code um, generation backend that generates wow. very generates machine code very quickly. It's more of a prototype just to see how fast it can be. It's very fast. It's about well on the artificial benchmark I tried. It's about 20 times faster than LLVM to compile. No, wow. To compile, okay. To compile, that's the key. It, so that backend would be used for development when you want to compile your stuff very quickly. Right. Yeah, because I'm, I'm uh, sorry, uh, implementing all of the same optimizations that yeah, LLVM yeah, does would yeah. be very difficult. And, uh, that, I'm not going to even yeah. att attempt that. <laughs> LLVM, so I'll, um, I could talk about it for hours, but LLVM is awesome. In the way it's absolutely amazing, with how it has very little information, it's a low level, you know, IR. And yet it can optimize, what it can do is just amazing. So we have these tests in, in Fortran that I test the compiler with things like for loops and it does some calculation, calculation integer, let's say, and then at the end I have if that integer is equal to 55, then exit with zero. 
otherwise exhibit an error. And then when I run it through LLVM, so LLVM just sees a bunch of, doesn't even have for loops, it just has, you know, uh, jumps. And yet it can, optim it can optimize everything out. And so the whole test is just a return zero. You know, it's just amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and, but yet, uh, so it's great for this kind of low level optimizations. Where LLVM is not that great is if you want to optimize arrays at this kind of higher level, things like it, well, it's still amazing what it can do, even just not knowing anything. It can unroll things, it can, you know, it's amazing. But for Fortran, it's not, not good enough. It, um, Fortran, for Fortran, what's really needed is um, to be able to optimize array loops that operate on arrays on kind of a higher level. Things like there's multiple different ways you can um, transform array operations into loops. And things like inlining and stuff like that, it's always better to do it at the higher level. So ASR, this abstract semantic representation L for L for turn, before passing it to LLVM. It's a similar idea as MLIR. It's um, MLIR is a library that's part of LLVM now. It's built on top of LLVM. It's a, it, it allows you to represent arrays and, and, and for loops and if statements in the IR itself precisely so that they can optimize it better. So it's okay. a similar idea. Did you consider writing your uh, Fortran parser and compiler in Fortran? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, I can maybe get back why I chose C++. It's, um, I knew that I could deliver this in C++ and, and make it very fast. So one of the things I wanted, you know, if I did, since I decided I'll, I'll do this, I wanted this to be the fastest compiler. I still want, I, I think it will be. That's my goal, fastest to compile. Uh, and to do that, you everything has to be fast. So the, the internal representation, the AST and ASR, has to be as fast as possible. And so to do that, I spent two months just benchmarking, you know, seven different ways how you can represent a tree in C++. So, mm. you know, as a class, you know, like inheritance, as C structs and, you know, casting, There's, and also how to visit the, the tree very efficiently. So there's again, so many different ways you can visit a tree in C++. You can have a, you know, a visitor pattern, you can have a just, you know, switch and, you know, there's many different ways you can do it. But also with C structs, you can have a, you can represent the AST as union, or you can have each AST node as, as you know, struct of different size. Also how you allocate the memory. Um, and so I kind of reused my experience by, uh, I've written this library called SimPy, which is a Python library for simple manipulation. Um, it's very successful, has a lot of users and, and contributors. It's a Python, it's great. It's, a, it's like Mathematica it, or Maple. It allows you to compute symbolic integrals and so on. But it's in Python, it's very slow. So I decided, well, if I want to make it fast, how, how do I do that? And I tried many different approaches. I tried C, I tried Cython. Cython is this great tool that allows you to kind of speed up Python with, with C and so on. Yeah. But eventually, I realized the only tool like I, I, C plus plus that allows me to do that to to deliver, and and you know I don't want to spend too much time on that. But essentially, we uh, in around 2015 we kind of delivered a library called Simengine, which is a C plus plus implementation of the kind of core of SimPy, and it has it's a, it's a tree in memory, and it it's using it's using reference counting as the memory management. We wrote our own reference counter, you know, very optimized. And eventually we made it the fastest library for symbolic manipulation that we benchmark. We benchmark against Mathematica, Maple, Sage, uh, Sim5, of course, Gina. It, it seemed like it's the fastest. So, and then when writing the compiler, I realized the compiler is, it's not really that different from SimEngine or SimPy. In fact, SimPy is a compiler. I just never thought about it that way, but what SimPy does, it allows you to parse, have all kinds of kind of input parsers. Uh, so it allows you to parse things, then it allows you to represent the you know, symbolic expression in memory, allows you to apply operations on it in memory, and then it has code generation, including even LLVM. So it is a compiler. I just never thought about it that way. So using this experience from SimEngine, I realized, well, the reference counting is one way, but I think there is a faster way to do that. And so after spending months kind of benchmarking different approaches, I ended up uh, using just essentially C struct, uh, a custom allocator, a linear allocator. So it just moves the pointer. Um, and and, the, visit, and the, the way to visit it uh, is the fastest that 
I was able to get is just a C, a C switch uh, where based on the type, it dispatches on the type, type is an integer, part of the struct. And then because it's a lot of boilerplate code, I generated. So I looked into how Python represents abstract syntax tree and they have they have this language called ASDL, which represents every AST, AST node. It's this nice kind of Haskell style or ML style language. Mm. And then they have a tool that can parse it and, and in their case they generate C, a C as a kind of representation of the AST. So I took that and I generate this, the very fast C++ implementation of this. Um, and then of course to make it easier for to use uh, we also generate a kind of we use CRTP pattern to generate very fast. It looks like classes, it looks like inheritance but it's all at compile time right and I, and I carefully benchmarked it to make sure there's no overhead and there's no measurable overhead. So from the user perspective, it looks like user, I mean the compiler developer, it looks like a class pretty much, and you have a visitor pattern and it gets called. And underneath is all this, comp not really complicated, but kind of tedious machinery that's generated automatically. Tedious. So yeah, and it's very fast. So, it's, uh, it can, so it can represent things fast, and then the parser is in Bison, and um, the, the tokenizer is in RE2C2. Um, yeah, and and then the, so now the slowest part is LLVM. <laughs> Even in the <laughs> debug mode, it's just really slow. It's great for optimizing, but if you just want fast compilation, uh, that's when I decided to see if we generate machine code directly, and it's much much faster. So right now we are working on the LLVM backend because we want that. That's the most versatile, and it will allow us to deliver, including some pretty good optimizations. But down the road, I would like to come back and see how the, the direct machine code generation, it could make it very fast. And I think as a user, as a Fortran user now, I would love if the compiler can really generate, generate the code 10 times faster than other compilers. I think it'd be really cool. So out of curiosity, did you uh, benchmark LLVM to see where the slowdowns are and see if you could contribute back to them to speed up your use cases by any chance? I did not. I would be curious. I. I always assume that it's just inevitable that they, it's the way they represent the IR. It's the fact that I have to even generate the IR. If right. I don't use LLVM, I generate the machine code just directly. I don't even do any assembly. I generate literally the machine code in memory uh, right away. Uh, uh, for all you know, there might just be like a while loop that says, if it looks like we're generating Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's slow it down a little bit. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> that seems unlikely. <laughs> uh, is the L four train compiler considered like ready for production use, or is there still more work to be done before it's you would recommend it for production? It's not ready for production. Um, it's ready for testing the parser that should be complete. If there are any bugs, you know we'll fix them, and then. Um, we, we, we have this proxy app snap that I mentioned in the past and we are trying to compile this 495 code and I'm hoping we'll be able to compile it in, in a matter of months uh, and we'll, ma we'll make a release uh, once we can compile it and then it will, it will be ready for first users. Okay. And you said in at the intro, you said your employer is at least partially funding these projects. Yes, so they fund me on Fortran 2 C++ translation as a help to some of our internal teams uh, that move away from Fortran. Uh, th that backend, yeah, should be ready also in, in you know, what, what, like the hardest part is not so much the backend, the hardest part is all the semantics and all the modules and you know, symbols, importing from modules, all this stuff. That's what we are working on right now. Once we can all get all the semantics, the backend will be very uh, relatively quick to update, to get up to speed. Since you mentioned modules and, and you talked about how Fortran has modules uh, in one of the newer versions, how, how does that compare to C++ modules? Are they comparable? I don't know. I haven't used C++ modules yet. <laughs> <That one Before>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the Fortran modules are, it's, it, it's, a, it, it's just a piece that has uh, subroutines, functions, uh, variables, and then you can use, it's, it's a, you just write use and um, and the name of the module and it imports everything from the module or you can just import one function and that that's pretty much all there is to it and and so that and so the, what the Fortran compilers do they so modules have dependencies so CMake for example it understands how 
this dependencies work and we'll call the Fortran compiler in the correct or order. So then we compile the modules in the, you know, so they eventually compile. And then each module gets compiled to a mod file. So, so object file and mod file. And the mod file contains compiler internal representation about what, what symbols are in the module. So that when you compile the next module, it knows what to expect in the object file. Yeah, we haven't really ever, I don't think, talked about this on the show, but CMake has full Fortran support, right? Yes. yes. Is CMake the standard or de facto standard for Fortran users as well? I would say so, yeah. Okay. That's what I would recommend, at least. Although we have a better solution, and that's the Fortran package manager that's modeled by Cargo from Rust. And oh, okay. so it's a, it's a build system and it's a package manager in one. And so, <clears throat> then you don't need to make uh, essentially FPM. So it's called FPM for drop package manager. You can use it. You can think of it as a high level. It has more information, has all the information in fact, about your project on a higher level than a CMake. So we are planning to, so right now we just compile your code directly, but we are planning to be able to generate CMake project for your code. Some people might prefer that so that you're, you know, if you don't want to use FPM. Um, <clears throat> The way cargo works, if you know you're not familiar, it's uh, it, it's opinionated, so it kind of assumes where things are on your disk, you know your files and so on. But if you follow that the layout, default layout, but if you follow it, everything just works. With it's 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 great, and so FPM does the same thing, same same philosophy, and so it can compile Fortran files, but we are also planning to allow to compile C and C plus plus files because. Oh. Uh, it's a lot of projects use both C, C++ and for running one. Right. So, and in terms of, as long as you're willing to follow the layout, uh, FPM can compile it for you also, or will be. That sounds pretty cool. So is FPM actually part of the Fortran 2018 standard? No, um, FPM is part of the Fortran Lang organization that we, we started about ah, a year, okay. year ago. Okay. And, and for, for me, this might be the most exciting project there because it, wor it works today. Uh, you can use it today. It's still in, you know, I would say alpha or beta kind of version, but it works today. It works with any Fortran compiler and you can use uh -huh. it to, to, to build, to use it as, you, you can finally have dependencies and finally create a Fortran package that others can use, which in the past was really, really hard. Uh, as I'm sure you know from C++, similar problems. Uh, uh, this is one way to fix them. So if you're listening to this and uh, you know maybe you have horror stories in your past uh, from Fortran or maybe you've never touched Fortran before, like I don't think I ever have, uh, what, what would be your pitch to a C++ developer? Why should you look into Fortran? If, if you are trying to solve some numerical or math, uh, application problem uh, then and you like fast compilation and uh, fast execution of your code i think you should definitely look at it if you like python and numpy and you enjoy um, uh, using those uh, you will also like fortran it feels very similar you just have to add types pretty much and, and the syntax is close uh, if you like julia i give fortran a shot also if you like matlab uh, the way i pitch it to our postdocs i ask them what do you, what tool do you use to, to prototype and they typically say well python or matlab or julia and then i ask them what you know when you want it to run fast for production what do you use and they say well c plus plus or, or fortran and then i say well wouldn't it be nice if you can use fortran interactively from the beginning and, and develop starting fortran let's say using l fortran and develop your prototype and then because it's already in Fortran, you can just take it and put it in the production code and it will also run fast. So, and I would say if your application is to write a compiler, I would, you know, as you see, I chose, I like Fortran, but I chose C++. So it's a <laughs> great application for C++. Yeah, that sounds like for numerical processing, you're saying this is where Fortran still has its niche even after 65 years or whatever, right? Right. Um, so, yeah. Right. I would say the issue with Fortran is language is very nice, uh, and still I would say has not realized its full potential. And the reason is that the tooling around Fortran and the compilers, I think, are a little bit lacking. And so that's what we are trying to fix. Awesome. Yeah, very cool. 
Um, anything else you want to tell our listeners about before we let you go? I feel like we've gone over a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I would say if you are interested, please join us. You know, go to fortranlang.org and join our discourse or just contact me. Um, I'm happy to get you up. You know, we are looking for contributors and users. Okay. And what's the best website to go to? fortran-lang.org. Okay, great. There are, there are links to this course and other things. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on today, Andre. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on.
Um, yes, um, yes, you can do that, but uh, you, you certainly can uh, have that output, you know, as you are running your cache to test, you can basically take that output and then pass it to uh, to the Tuka server. Uh, wow. So in this case, you are integrating the Tuka client library with your te unit test you right. know, uh, executable. So that's possible. Um, and I think I like that approach more than having your output stored in a file and then later have a separate kind of uh, process for submitting sure. that output. Right. Um, and can Tuka tell you that, you know, some numbers trending down or trending up or yes. staying flat? Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, I guess at this point, the um, the analytics that we provide for the behavioral differences is a slightly more mature uh, and you know um, more helpful than for the performance. However, um, Tuka can show uh, in its UI the trends of differences for different you know functions uh, over different versions of the code. And I have found it very helpful uh, because usually, you know, you want to look at a chart and see that over time, uh, your, you know, tiny little code changes kind of amount to a performance hiccup uh, or, you know, uh, a slowdown in yeah. a, a piece of workflow. So uh, all it does right now, uh, the, the interface is just giving you a chart, uh, uh, you know, showing you, um, how how the performance uh, changes over uh, different versions? For many things, that's that's good enough. Yeah. Yes, I I think that might be um, enough for people to find value. But uh, I have much higher ambitions <laughs> in uh, in terms of how to make it more helpful for users. In this case, I really think that performance um, tracking performance is slightly more tricky than behavior because. Uh, it usually has some noise. Right. Um, mm -hmm. It is not guaranteed to stay exactly the same. So you want to have a way of um, looking at the performance changes as a human being uh, looks at it, right? We, we look at a chart, we say, oh, well, this dropped 1% uh, or two for this particular version. Well, we don't care as long as this is not consistent over you know, a few versions. Right. Should we talk more about like the actual Tuka, you know, website interface and and what that process is like? I, I did watch one of the videos you put up that was uh, linked to that article two weeks ago. Awesome. Um, yes. So um, again, I think the plat. So the the Tuka server um, helps you not just store your results, but also compares them against different versions. Mm -hmm. Now, the comparison uh, certainly has some output in the, the, the differences. So the, uh, the server attempts to visualize those differences. And uh, the, the visualization of those differences is something you can look at uh, for each given version. As your test is being executed, you can go uh, you know, have a look. But then after all the test cases are executed, the uh, server is going to send uh, a notification to members of your team and say, hey, this particular version that you just ran has uh, these differences. So mm. that report that it generates is more high level uh, mm. because it wants it's meant to be consumed uh, by everyone uh, to give them an insight into how the, you know this particular version has behaved. So that you can look at that email or a Slack notification and say, well, this is not this is not what we expected. So let's go take a look. But in some cases, you may make intentional changes to the software, uh, in which case you would use the platform again. You go there, you click a button and say, this from now on, this is the version uh, that you know that I trust that my right. software should behave from now on. So um, that is also kind of automated, the, the way that all this, these versions are basically tracked. Uh, you can add comments uh, to kind of communicate with your team members and then have audit logs for how your software is evolving over time. Now, do I need to inform the Tuka server that I'm going to add some new variable or value, or can I just do that nope. ad hoc? Okay. You can do that ad hoc. Yeah. In fact, you can uh, do that with test cases as well. You can add, uh, you know, as many test cases as you want at any one time. Um, 
The advantage of having this uh, remote test server is that it is aware of the test cases that are part of your baseline version, right? So right. Uh, the advantage for that is you can then not have your test cases listed as you're running the test. So uh, a normal Tuka test um, code doesn't specify its test cases because the when, when you have access to a library, the library can query the list of test cases from the server. And therefore, you don't have expected values and you don't have the list of test cases. All you have in that regression test code is how you run your, uh, your workflow under test and then what data you want to capture. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't think we've mentioned yet what uh, platforms, compilers are supported. Yes, um, so the C++ uh, client library for uh, Tuka has uh, support for uh, all platforms. So the, well, all known pro uh, commonly used platforms, Mainly. right? Windows, Windows Linux, all Linux and So yes, it can work one. on my Commodore 64 code <laughs> that I've been, uh, no, I'm just. I am very, yeah, I am regretting to say that, <laughs> having said that. But, but in general, uh, I've basically, I think, um, because the end users might be using code bases that are somewhat dated, I wanted to support you know a wide range of compiler versions, a wide range of standards. So uh, starting C++ 11, um, it kind of covers um, you know the relatively recent versions of the C++ uh, <laughs> standard, um, and then uh, the compilers. I think uh, GCC uh, eight and Clang uh, 8 are both supported, um, as well as MSVC. Um, I think uh, for 20, 2013 um, is oh, supported, wow. which is okay. giving me a lot of headache, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I wouldn't. You might have drop it. No. <laughs> yes. You might drop I it going is, forward. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I think 2015 would even cover most of the uh, current um, console dev kits, actually. That's right. However, um, the so because this uh, started as a side project and then kind of obtained for as an internal tool at the, my former employer, I had to make it possible for us to use it with you know the most outdated codes that we had, which happened to be using MSVC 13. So. <laughs> okay, so I, I feel like I well should ask this, or I'm, I'm very curious. Anyhow, you mentioned in your bio that you recently left your former employer to pursue this, and then you've also just publicly said that you began development of this project at your former employer. So you That's left right. with their blessing, I assume, to yes. So for <laughs> our listeners, um, yeah. So when so at least in the U.S. Uh, I think the norm is that when you uh, start working somewhere, uh, are your future, I, you know, IP developed IP would belong to the company that you are working for, right. and that seems a little weird for others. But uh, here we all understand that. Now the uh, the problem was because this was started when I was working at uh, my employer, so uh, I, I basically had to work on it only at nights and weekends. Um, but then because I was so obsessed with it and everybody knew that I'm working on it for so long, um, they all had my, you know, kind of their blessing. Uh, so I got the IP rights and that's uh, only when I uh, was able to start uh, speaking with people um, and uh, showing the product to them outside the company. Oh, and the way you had described it, I thought that you had actually started development on this on the company's dollar which would have the they would own it i think in pretty much any country if that had been the case that's right yes <laughs> yes but this was a side project uh and for me it was very important uh, to kind of separate the work that i am uh, doing for this project with all the uh, other work that i do uh, for the company you know right tasks okay um so that's cool. yeah you said you've been working on this, I think, for two or three months, uh, kind of on your own. Um, Full time. That's yeah. Right. How well has that been going? Like, are you getting like funding? Do you have uh, users? No, I don't have funding yet, uh, okay. and I'm not seeking funding right now. I'm uh, I'm seeking my first ten customers, uh, ten paying okay. customers, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, I have um, since leaving uh, 
you know, Vital, I have now about 10 active uh, individual users um, that are using the uh, product uh, on a weekly basis. Now, um, there are also a couple engineering teams uh, that, you know, are evaluating the product uh, for larger scale use uh, in their organizations. Um, now, I still don't have any paying customer and um, I'm, I'm actively working on uh, finding my first time. Um, I want to say right now that my, my primary objective is to get uh, as much feedback as I can from right. actual people who have this problem, the problem that we had at my company. Um, so the conversations I've had with uh, software engineers over the past three, uh, four months has been extremely uh, interesting, uh, just to find that we all are suffering from the same issues uh, is kind of giving me, uh, you know, goosebumps. Um, but in general, it's, al it's also very motivating in terms of, you know, the possibilities of improving what uh, can be improved in terms of how we maintain software at large scale. Right. Well, so if, if listeners are interested in trying out the project and you know, becoming a, a user, paying or otherwise, you know, what kind of options are there? So right now the platform, uh, so I should say that the remote Tuka server can be deployed on premise as well okay. as a cloud hosted version. So the cloud hosted version is deployed at Tuka.io. Um, listeners and uh, anyone who is interested can actually go create an account for free. They can use the uh, client libraries for C++ uh, and Python um, to submit test results. So everything is free uh, right now. But uh, once they want to use it for like uh, teams of up to say uh, more than five uh, members, then right now there is a pricing plan, uh, but it's still like, I, I don't want it to be a blocker. I want mm -hmm. to kind of just have users that are using the product and not worry about paying. So. Um, in general, everything right now is uh, as free as it can be. And I'm going to keep the uh, free plan for the Tuka.io uh, platform, uh, you know, forever permanent. Um, so there's always a way of, uh, you know, working uh, and getting value out of this product without paying anything. Okay. Very cool. So like I mentioned before, the project I'm working on already has a regression solution that does work. Uh, so I don't know if we would be interested for this, for this particular, um, for, for that problem with your solution. But I am like really needing to start tracking more statistics like binary size, bloaty output, like, you know, ABI diffs, that kind of thing. Can I use the Python interface to push those things in a meaningful way to... Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, I think it was two weeks ago when you mentioned that uh, on the right. podcast. And uh, it's it's interesting that um, it was the first time that I was thinking of this, you know, being a possible use case. And therefore I was interested enough to try it with the new uh, client library for Python. Uh, so I'm calling the, um, you know, ABI diff and then getting the output and submitting it uh, to the platform. It's very um, simple. So by the time that this uh, podcast is released, I'm hopeful that I can have a, um, you know, a GitHub repository uh, that is public that shows, you know, how to do this um, so that, you know, anyone who is interested can try. Awesome. <laughs> very cool. Okay, well, uh... Where should listeners go if they want to go and, and try out Tuka, Peshman? I would recommend uh, that they start with Tuka.io. Uh, mm -hmm. There are links there, especially in the documentation to um, GitHub repository for the C++ client library, if they want to start integrating that and then have, uh, getting started. And there are so many different getting started guides uh, in terms of, you know, just if, if they are curious to um, get more information about how, you know, the, the platform works. Okay. Anything else uh, you wanted to tell our listeners about before we let you go, Peshman? Um, well, I just wanted to mention that, you know, this 
project started with a C++ uh, client library. So it's near and dear to my heart in a way. And I feel like uh, the best that I can get out of the C++ community is their advice and feedback. So um, I'd like uh, for our, your listeners to um, see if, you know, um, check out the product uh, and then um, see if they can uh, find it useful or not. And then share their thoughts with me as I'm starting this journey. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is um, for the past uh, three, four years that I've been listening to this podcast, uh, I've been thinking that I would come, if I would ever uh, join you, uh, I would uh, plug the work that you're doing at my former employer now, uh, which is certainly interesting, uh, technically very challenging. And for a C++ engineer, it's the best type of work that I've ever uh, experienced. So um, I'm sure that uh, you're still hiring. And if um, you're interested, looking for a fun challenge, um, check out Vital Images. Vital Images. We've ever talked about medical imaging on the show before, but I'm sure there's a lot of C++. You know, I turned down a job that was related to medical imaging because it made me too nervous. What if I got something <laughs> wrong? I didn't want to. I didn't want to kill someone. <laughs> basically. Yes, but on the flip side, um, writing good code might actually save someone's life. Yes, so. that's what my wife tells me, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank Pajma. you again. Yeah. Awesome, thanks for coming on.